All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, today's uh, kitchen is going to cover the roadmap for the ZD fabric. Um, the focus on HA, which is high availability. Um, I'm Paul Lorenz, a member of the, the core team. Um, and before anything else, I wanted to welcome some new developers to the team, Cam and Todd. Uh, it's been exciting to see their contributions start to roll in. Um, they're going to be focusing on, on fabric work as well, so it's exciting. So uh, first, I want to talk about what our goals are for the fabric uh, in, the, in the near term. So more resilience, better performance, and reduced technical debt. Uh, so why these goals? The, um, the fabric is, is basically data in motion, and it already does that, right? It, it moves data around. Um, so the, the idea is, you know, can we get, can we keep the data up to keep the data moving more resilience? Can we get, can we move the data faster? Can we see, uh, whose data is moving where and how fast and can we figure out why the data stopped moving? Can we, can we get faster at making the, at the fabric better? Um, and then obviously maintaining security is, is not always stated, but it's a perpetual goal. And, you know, there will be occasional features that, that come in mostly around, um, more controls around where the data flows, um, but, but resilience, performance, and technical debt are our primary goals for now. So uh, in more specific terms, uh, more resilience is where HA comes in, right? So uh, if we have the ability to run multiple controllers across multiple regions or availability zones, uh, that gives us resilience to, to outages either of you know a, a, a single controller dying or that instance going down or the whole availability zone, availability zone or the region going down. You know, we recently had an AWS outage that affected us. So this would give us some more resilience to that. Um, and it would also give us better performance, right? We can uh, allow the controller to be horizontally scaled so we can divide uh, end users up among those. And so, so we can support more users and uh, also put those controllers hopefully closer to where the end users are. Uh, and, and give them a better experience that way. Um, in terms of reducing technical debt, we want to do a few things. We want to make sure we maintain and improve our APIs to make sure that we can keep uh, our development velocity up, uh, reduce the number of bugs, make it easier to find and fix bugs, and um, make sure that we have a, a transparent system, right? So uh, making sure that we can figure out when uh, our resilience and our performance fails, that we can figure out why those things happen, figure out, you know, why did this go down? Why did the data stop flowing here? You know, how, how is this affecting uh, the end user? Uh, and so before talking about the, the future, I wanted to kind of do a, a brief dive into the past um, to see how we, you know, where we were, how, where we are now and, and kind of where we're going. Um, so I know there's a, there was, there was, a, you know, ZD before, uh, before this, uh, but when I joined the team, this is kind of how things looked. Um, we had separate controllers for the edge and the fabric. We had separate routers for the edge and the fabric. We had separate data stores for the edge and the fabric, um, separate APIs for those things. Um, since then, a lot of those things have, have been consolidated, right? So we have a single controller, a single router, um, and our, our APIs are, are not 100% consolidated, but they're pretty close. So there's still a little things, a few things that are fabric specific, but um, but mostly we you can do everything through the same set of uh, APIs now, um, while still maintaining that that separation where you can run a pure fabric network if you want to. You can enable the edge in just those places where you want it. You can configure the uh, the APIs uh, separately so you can have the the rest the the uh, edge API on, on this port and the Fabric API on this port. Um, uh, so I think it's it's been a nice advancement to, to kind of, uh, the, the system is now much easier to run and, and manage uh, while still hopefully maintaining the flexibility that we had to begin with. Uh, as we move towards um, HA and distributed uh, control, uh, it's gonna start to look more like this where we have multiple controllers, uh, each of them able to talk to the router mesh um, so again, moving more towards more to, towards more complexity. Um, so one of our our goals is to try to make this uh, more complex system still easy to manage. Hopefully, 
Um, and, and longer term, it's possible that we'll move to something that looks more like this, where we do more consolidation and consolidate the controllers and the routers into a single instance type where you know, we'll have some, some of those routers, router slash controllers be, be special in some way. Uh, but overall, maybe the, the information will be shared across the, the whole system in a more uniform way, uh, letting things again be a little, little simpler. But that's, that's sort of a, uh, a North Star rather than a next step. So next step is, is this, and we may take it all the way to this uh, once we get past the, 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 the next stage. All right, so if we've got our, uh, we wanna have our, our multiple controllers running, uh, in order for this to work, efficiently and well, they're gonna to have to share some data, right? So uh, let's talk about how, how we manage that. So first, you know, what's available to share? We have, we have our data model. Um, and if we kind of break this up by uh, how things, uh, you know, sort of functional use cases, right? So we have a set of things in the model that make services work, right? If they, we have to define the services, we have to know what our routers are, we have to know how they're connected to each other, we have to know where services terminate, we have to be able to set up paths and circuits across those things. Um, this is basically you know, the, the fabric piece um, of, of ZD. And then on top of that, we have things to enforce access control, right? Who is allowed to access services, how they're allowed to access them, who's allowed to use which, uh, which edge routers, you know, how are these identities authenticated, um, things for managing uh, continuous authentication uh, and then sort of runtime data tracking, you know, who's been authenticated against what. And then we also have a few things uh, in the edge that are there to help SDK applications. So config types and configs. This is just a way for uh, services to have associated information that the SDKs can see and things like the tunnelers use this to uh, configure themselves to know like how to intercept and how to host services. So uh, we want to kind of break this model down into uh, various components and say, you know, these kinds of things in the model have to be handled this way. These other things in the model maybe have to be handled a different way, right? We, not everything has a, a uniform set of requirements. So uh, the questions we kind of want to ask are, does this data need to be shared at all? Uh, does it need to be always consistent or can it be eventually consistent or does it, you know, need to be known only in some places. Do we need, does everyone need to see this information? Uh, how fast do we, to, do we need to be able to read the data? How fast do we need to write it? Um, how important is it that this data is always available versus always consistent? So if we break this up into kind of two separate pieces, we can view it as sort of uh, model definitions. So things that, that define how the system works versus runtime data which is more tracking how uh, the system is currently being used, right? Things like circuits are, you know, are, are not definitional. They're not um, constantly, uh, they're, not, they're not consistent. They're uh, always being added and removed. They're just showing how the system is currently used. Same for, you know, posture data and API sessions and sessions. Those things are, uh, you know, tracking who's authenticated and how they've authenticated and what they currently have access to, but not, um, not defining you know, what those things are and how they relate to each other. So for model definitions, uh, we can we kind of define them this way that, that this information needs to be visible everywhere on, on every controller. So uh, for a controller to work, it needs to know what the services are and needs to know what the identities are and how those things relate. Um, the data is read all the time by, by end users, right? We're always checking to see what our, our services are. We're always checking authentication and seeing, and does this have access to this? Um, and we need the data to be available consistently, right? Uh, if uh, one of the controllers goes down, we don't wanna stop the other controllers from being able to continue to function. Um, and we might be able to also have some degree of eventual consistency where if a controller becomes isolated from the rest of the cluster, maybe we allow um, uh, circuits to continue to work on that controller for a while. We may allow new, new circuits to uh, continue to work against that controller for a little while um, so that we have a, some amount of, of, of reasonable time where maybe, maybe measured in maybe seconds to minutes where we can say, well, this thing is isolated 
uh, will allow the, 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 the current model to continue working for some amount of time and that'll give us a chance to, to, to fix what's wrong, to you know, reestablish uh, connection to the, to the network. Um, on the other hand, uh, on the right side, uh, generally writes don't happen from uh, end users, they only happen from administrators, right? Where, when you're actually changing the definitions of the system, you're adding a service or you're adding an identity or you're allowing uh, an identity to access new services or removing access to services. Um, and from that perspective, speed needs to be reasonable, but it doesn't need to be blazing fast, right? If, if someone's adding a service, they don't care if it happens in, in a, you know, 10 milliseconds or uh, even a few seconds, right? They just, they just want to make sure that it happened properly. Um, and it's not as important to keep right, uh, right availability there, right? If uh, someone can't add services or, or change access for a little bit, that's, uh, it's obviously not great, but it's not as important as making sure that the end user can continue to use services. Um, and it definitely needs to be consistent, right? We don't want to have a state where you know, maybe two controllers lose connection with each other and then somebody makes an update to the model on one side and somebody else makes a different update to the model on the other side, then we have to resolve those conflicts, right? We want our model to be consistent at all times. Um, if someone makes a, makes a change, we want to make sure that that change is accepted and that it's visible everywhere and uh, that there's, there's no confusion about how things, uh, you know, about ordering or how things are applied. Um, and for uh, making sure that the model is consistent, that generally involves controller to controller coordination, right? This is all about, this is data that's for controllers and they have to coordinate amongst each other to make sure that, that this is working properly. Uh, for runtime data, we have, you know, maybe different guarantees here, right? So this, not, not everyone necessarily needs to know about all the runtime data. If, if one controller sets up a, a circuit, um, that doesn't necessarily need to be shared among all the controllers. Uh, if one of them establishes a session, again, that, that we need to be able to, to verify that session, but it doesn't necessarily need to be pushed across all controls so that everyone has a consistent view of all the sessions that are in existence. Um, and for runtime data, reads and writes have to be very fast, right? If we don't want to wait a couple of seconds to establish a circuit, uh, if someone wants to start to use the service, they want to be able to start to use it very quickly. Um, and this generally, involves more SDK to controller or SDK to router or router to router coordination. So you know, we have some different ways that we could replicate our data. You know, there's things like shared caches, like memcached or hazelcast, or there's, you know, there's a bunch of solutions out there. Um, there's also uh, various consensus algorithms with different implementations like Paxos, which is used by Zookeeper, or Raft, which is used by uh, Console and etcd. Um, so let's, let's take a look at RAF specifically to see what kind of guarantees it can give us. Uh, so it's, it's a consensus protocol, stands for reliable, uh, replicated, redundant, and fault tolerant. Um, and it implements a cluster-based event log, right? So that means that it has a, a series of events that happen and they have a specific order in which they happen. Um, so uh, when, when an event comes in, we want to apply that event to the log. Uh, we have to get everyone to agree on that. So we send that out to the cluster and then the cluster votes on it and says, guess this is okay. And then uh, if, if we get an, a, a majority of the people to, or you know, a quorum to agree, then we can apply that to the log. So what that means is that we always need to have uh, a majority, so more than half of the nodes to agree on things. That means that if we have, obviously, if you have, if you have one node, um, that one node, if that one node fails here, you're out of luck. If you've got two nodes, if one of them fails, you can't get more than half, right? You only have half. So if you, if, if you have two nodes, it's still only going to work if they're both running. So you need at least three nodes, then one of them can fail, then the other two can still agree with more than half of the vote. So generally, you do things in odd numbers. You'll have you know, three nodes, so one can fail, five nodes, two can fail, seven nodes, three can fail, that kind of thing. So you can run the cluster in whatever size setup for whatever amount of redundancy you want. Um, writes are, are uh, forwarded to the current leader, cluster votes, everyone applies. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's used by console and CD and you know, a bunch of other uh, bits of software as well, but it's, it's uh, uh, generally, uh, it's, already, it's a widely used and, and well accepted protocol. Um, 
So for writes, it, it definitely goes for consistency over availability and has good but not, not stellar performance. Um, and on the read side, uh, because every node has the full state, um, we can just read, you know, from a read perspective, we can pretend that we're running in a single cluster or in a single node mode, right? Everything is already available to us. We don't have to reach out to the cluster to get, to get the state. Um, the local state may be slightly behind where the leader is if, uh, you know, the leader has uh, already applied the latest update and is now sending out the notification that everyone can, can apply it as well. Um, you know, you might be you might be a little bit behind, and if you get disconnected from the cluster, your state will will lag, uh, but it will catch up when you reconnect. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, uh, we get we get the the consistency for writes and the uh, fast reads that we want. And if you want latest state, you can always uh, check who the current leader is and, and check with them. So, but this this lines up very closely with what we want for model definitions, uh, and. We've prototyped and, and tested this with a 60 node cluster spread across uh, uh, East Coast, West Coast, US, as well as India. Um, and uh, when the voting kind of happened close to each other, so if, if we had, say, the leader in US East, it could get agreement from US West. Um, those times were very quick, relatively speaking, so 100 milliseconds to make, say, a, to, for creating a service. Uh, if you're running from somewhere where you have to do uh, you know, more, more coordination uh, across longer links, it takes a little more time. So if you're running from, a, from AP South in India, uh, because there's just more communication needs to happen over longer links, it can take maybe half a second. Um, but still uh, times I think that are, are reasonable for uh, updating service definitions as opposed to, you know, creating, uh, creating a new uh, connection. And if we added a whole bunch of uh, additional nodes that were just uh, sharing the data but didn't have to vote, uh, the times were pretty much the same. So, you know, looking forward, if we ever uh, get to the point where routers and controllers are one thing, and we have a large set of routers, and some of them are designated as voters, the the raft uh, consensus protocol can support that, where we'll still have reasonable times, and we'll be able to to spread the model across all those instances without any real performance issues. So, in order to use raft in our code, we need to you know, rework our code to be event-based. You know, right now, if you want to create a service, you hit the uh, the REST endpoint, and it makes the changes directly to the local uh, Bolt database. Uh, in order for this to work in Raft, you have to kind of package up the create service in an event and uh, forward it to the leader, and uh, make it make it make it uh, so that that can be sent out across the whole cluster. So it's just a little. It, the code mostly stays the same, but you need to kind of be able to package things up into these events and, and ship them across the network. Um, we also, you know, just once you've got a cluster, you need to be able to manage that cluster. So uh, being able to uh, add and remove things from the cluster, being prepared to do round robin upgrades, making sure that all works. Uh, I have to do a whole bunch of testing around node failure and node isolation to see, you know, what happens if we, uh, you know, cut the network links between one of the controllers and the other ones. How do we detect when that happens? How do how long do we want to let that run in that state? Um, when we reestablish things, do things properly, uh, catch up, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then once you have a model, right now, you know, our data model is, is in a single instance. So if we do an upgrade, we upgrade our data model there and everything is uh, consistent. If we want to make changes to the data model in a world where we have multiple controllers, then um, we need to make sure that we can handle that, right? So, uh, Making sure that we have a way to say, you know, if if even for for a short period, if so we're just doing a round robin, uh, upgraded the controllers, making sure that uh, the changes get get applied in a way where if if one controller has a, an older version of the data model and one has a newer one, that we have a way to uh, still continue to work and make sure that once the older one catches up to the data model, that it um, uh, continues to you know, doesn't, that we don't lose any data in the meantime. Uh, for the runtime data, uh, we have uh, some, some ideas as well. So uh, for API sessions and sessions, um, there's a plan to turn those into to bearer tokens, right? So right now, the, the way things generally work is you uh, create a token, uh, you, you, you create a session, 
that has a, a token associated with it that gets uh, sent back to the clients and also gets sent out to all the routers so everybody knows about it. Um, another way to do that is to, instead of just having a, a simple token is to sign that token so that it can be verified independently, right? So when, we, when, a, con when a controller uh, signs a token and sends it to the, back to the end, end user and then the end user then sends that to a, a router, the router will be able to look at it and without checking in with the controller, be able to say, okay, I can see that this was uh, signed by a controller and it expires at this time. Um, and then instead of having to you know, share sessions everywhere, we only have to manage if somebody's uh, session expires or it gets, gets revoked uh, before, um, before the expiration of that session. So then we still have to manage uh, you know, sending some data around, but it's, it's just for revocation instead of for distributing the entire set of, of sessions. Um, and this is something that, that uh, Andrew will, will likely be working on. He's got uh, some plans there. So I would look forward to a, a future talk probably from Andrew about how that's all gonna work. And similarly for Pasha data, I know he's been looking at how that's going to work as well in a distributed world. So um, it'll be the same talk, but uh, I would look forward to, to information from Andrew on that. Um, for circuits, they will probably stay uh, mostly as they are for now. So whoever, whichever controller creates a circuit will, will own it and manage it. And the only thing we'll really need to change there is routers will have to know, you know which controller owns a specific circuit. Uh, and we'll have to do some things there with you know, making sure that you know, if a, if a given controller goes down uh, and the router sees that, then they'll have to say, okay, well, this, this circuit that belongs to a controller that no longer exists, maybe we'll give it some grace period to continue running, um, but we'll probably at some point have to, to terminate this circuit uh, if that controller never comes back. Uh, any questions at this point? Okay. Hey Paul, can you uh, can you please explain on uh, the the last slide again uh, on uh, what we what we are trying to optimize uh, with respect to the tokens in the API sessions? Okay, so um, so right now uh, when you create a session, uh, it is there's a few things we do with it, right? So we uh, persist it in the database. Uh, we uh, send it to uh, the end user, we send it, uh, if, at least for API sessions, all the API sessions get sent to all the, um, all the routers. For regular sessions, we persist those as well. We send them to the end user. We don't send them to all the routers because when a end user sets up a new connection, um, they, they send that, the session token along with it. Um, and then the router then forwards that to the controller and uh, the controller then verifies that that session is valid for that given set for that given service. So, you know, we kind of do a lot of, of uh, shuffling around of, of session information and storing of session information. Um, and in a, in a distributed world where you've got multiple controllers, that gets more complicated, right? If yeah. we want to, you know, we don't want to have to have every session live on every controller and then or alternately have each session only owned by one controller, but then have to work with that controller, right? If you uh, kind of share that information along with the session, and then the, and the, the end router doesn't have any choice about which controller it works with. So if that controller went, were to go down, for example, um, then you wouldn't be able to use that session anymore. So the idea is that if you um, can sign your sessions, sign your, sign your, your tokens, um, then you don't need to store them anymore, really, and you don't need to uh, distribute them as much. You, they will, can be verified along the path, right? So you send a, a signed uh, session token back to the end user. It sends it to the router it wants to use. It can look at that without talking to the controller and say, I can see this was created by, by the controller, right? And then uh, we probably, you know, the, the only thing we need to do then is, um, you know, in general, there'll be, there'll be relatively short, probably expiration periods on those to be able to, to get a, uh, to get them extended. But if we have them uh, with relatively short um, expiration times, then, um, you know, somebody uh, has access to a service removed ahead of time, we'll have to send out some things saying, you know, the, uh, uh, any, any tokens that are associated with this need to be 
be revoked and not used anymore. And you'll have to keep those for as long as the expiration time is. So if the expiration time is you know half an hour, you'll have to keep those revocation sets around for that long. Um, but it's it's a lot less to distribute, right? Because in general, it's it's a much smaller use case of somebody having a session that gets revoked as opposed to all the sessions that you've got. Does that does that help? Yeah. Okay, cool. Quick question, Paul. Can you remind me what is the difference between an API session and a circuit? Uh, so a circuit um, is the uh, is, is is basically like how how data flows through the fabric, right? So an API session um, is in, is uh, tells you that you have access to ZD at all, right? So before you can do anything, you have to get an API session, and that says, okay, you you've got access to the system. Well, you have an identity. You're allowed to do things in ZD. You then get a, a session which says you have access to either dial or host this particular service. And then once you've got that, um, you can use that session over and over again to make connections with that, uh, with that session. And every time you make a connection, it sets up a circuit. So the circuit is basically saying um, this, uh, this data is going to flow from router A to router B to router C. and um, that, that can change over time, right? So that circuit may at some point switch the midpoint from router B to router D, uh, but it's keeping track of how the data is flowing, which routers it's on, uh, and making sure that, um, that, that you have a path for your data. You know, if, if say router B goes down, it will try to reroute your data and create a different path for that circuit. Um, and then when uh, one, one, one side or the other of the uh, connection, uh, is taken down, that circuit is then also taken down. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that's good, thank you. Cool, any other questions? Okay, so I wanna do a, a little bit of a, a deep dive into links because links, even though they're uh, in, the, in the definition side of the model, they're also a little bit uh, different from everything else in that uh, links represent uh, an actual thing, right? A service is, is, is just a definition, but a link, uh, even though it's used to you know, figure out how routers are connected, it represents something that actually exists as a, as a connection between routers. And there are things that, that come and go, right? So uh, when we bring the system up, uh, there are no links established yet, right? They, uh, they have to be, uh, told to be created, we have to tell router A to connect to router B to create a link between those two things. And so the links in the controller should really map to the actual physical connections that are out there. Um, and uh, they're also transient, like unlike everything else that's in the, in the model, they're not stored in, the, uh, in both. So when the controller goes down and comes back up again, it doesn't know about any of the existing links. So before uh, version, uh, 0.25 of ZD, uh, the controller and the routers could get out of sync, right? If the, control, if the controller went down and came back up again, all the links would still be there between all the various routers that had been previously been established. But the controller wouldn't know about them and it would set up a whole new set of links. Um, or if a router went down uh, or, you know, it would assume that all the links were gone, but if it was just the connection between the router and the controller that went down, it would assume the same thing and set up a whole new set of links. Um, so you know, that, that was already sort of problematic, but then additionally in a world where you've got multiple controllers, who is going to be in charge of creating new links, right? So if you've got three controllers or five controllers, we don't want each of them to set up their own set of links because uh, that's not particularly efficient. And we don't want to, it, it would be preferable if we didn't have to designate one to do it uh, because in, in a raft world, um, the leader changes on a regular basis. So we don't, if we want to do it on the leader, then we have to kind of figure out, wait, am I currently leader? Am I doing this? Am I you know, managing these things? So uh, the changes we made are that uh, we kind of try to accept that the links are owned by the routers instead of by the controller um, because the router actually knows about the link. It has that physical connection. It can tell if it's there or not. And it's the one that, that makes the link. Um, so, uh, now routers can notify the controller of existing links. So when uh, the controller goes down and comes back up again and the routers still have a bunch of links, on reconnect to the, uh, 
uh, to the controller, it will tell it, I have these links. And um, if the controller tries to uh, tell it to establish a link that it already has, it will uh, let it know, I've already got one, I'm fine. And, and then the controller can just go, go ahead and use the, the link that's already there. Um, we also, uh, because we're doing this, we have to have now an idea of, you know, what makes a link unique, right? So the, the router has to know, if I get a, a request to dial this other router, um, how do I know if I have that link or not? So uh, that's been a kind of an interesting uh, journey to see what, what makes a, a, a link unique, you know, is it, just the uh, just the router, or do we want to include things like what protocol is being used? Do uh, do we want to be able to have um, more information, like uh, be able to kind of tag things, separate things? Do we want to be able to have different interfaces? Um, so th there's still some some work ongoing there to be able to enable some of those things, like uh, uh, links over over multiple interfaces and and a better version of link costing, but. Um, because we now have, uh, we're now making sure that links are unique. You know, previously when you spun up a, a ZB system with where you had listeners in multiple places, you would end up a lot of times with with uh, two links between routers. Now, because we're checking for uniqueness, we'll, you'll only end up with one. Uh, and because if you only got a single link, uh, and you're, you know, sort of being a little bit aggressive about making sure that you only have a single link, we also want to be aggressive about making sure that that link is okay. So uh, we've added some uh, heart beating to it so that. Uh, it's it's constantly checking to make sure that this link is able to send and receive data well, and um, we've improved the uh, you know, proves we have latency checks going over over links, but now uh, they piggyback on top of the the heart beating, and uh, so there now we're separating the latency of measurements uh, so you can tell you know is this is this the portion of how long it's taking for the data to get there or is this how long it's taking to get queued right because before. Uh, latency was uh, an agglomeration of um, how long it took to get to be sent and the actual time to send and re be returned. So now we can get some more insight into the system that way. Um, and this, you know, now that, that it's, uh, the router is telling the controllers that there are already links of this kind, we don't, we can just let the controllers try to establish links on their own and they'll be notified, right? If, if two controllers try to tell a router to establish a link from, from it to another one, the first one will go ahead and establish that link and the second one will get a notification saying we already have this link here's the information for it um, so this kind of lets us uh, avoid the the problem of of uh, you know trying to have trying to be clever on the controller side by letting the the routers uh, be clever on their side Paul quick question I, I assume but checking we've handled the case of we get asked by a second controller to set up links and we are currently establishing so we don't have link information to return um, yet, but we do have a, the ability to return a currently working on it status. Uh, yeah, there, yeah, it's, um, uh, it, it kind of tracks things differently, whether you're in the middle of establishing a dial versus if you've already established a, a link, um, but it, yeah, it, it handles that use case where, you know, when things first come up, um, there's going to be kind of a, a flurry of things, right? So, yeah, it makes, we have to we have to, to handle that case. Right. Just checking. Thank you. Yep. Paul, cool. quick question on the latency queue latency. Do, does that mean, for example, you would be able to see the actual latency between point A and point B on the wire is, let's say, less, but then there's local buffering or queue on the underlying, so like congestion on the underlay. Exactly. There. Yeah, that, that's yeah, that's exactly the point. Because sometimes it's, and we have, we've done the same thing for the control channel as well. So now control channel and links both have this where you can see, and see you know is is this is this latency latency high because there's a bunch of messages queued up, uh, or is it is it slow because um, the actual wire uh, connection is slow? I.e., you could then start saying, for example, you need to increase your machine size, or maybe you should fix a better underlay network because you you're you know, you're generating your own latency or your isp is right yeah it's just and i mean we kind of approached it more from uh you know things are slow but we can't tell why um but yeah that it would help us figure out um you know maybe are we cpu bound versus network bound mm -hmm. um or 
is uh, a lot of times, you know, things can be slow because the receiving side maybe is being slow. So that, that's still kind of, um, there's still that, that extra variable tied up in there. Um, but it, it at least helps us uh, pull things apart a little bit. And so second question, the, the additional link cost in, how is that on top of what we already do today? So the, the problem with the current link costing is that uh, you can set a cost on a link, but the link is transient, right? So if you, if you go through and set costs on all your links, that's great until that link dies. And then the link comes back, is reestablished, but it doesn't remember what the original cost was, right? Um, so we want to be able to have something that, that's more of a, a model definition type uh, entity something like uh, a link rule or a link template or you know something like that that says a link that looks like this should have this cost right so a link that um, goes uh, from from a to b should have this cost or a link that maybe we're, you know we've added uh, uh, cost tags to link definitions so uh, the ability to say you know something that's got a cost tag of um, of satellite should have this increased cost, for example. Right, so it's, it's basically kind of building up a, a history and a standard model to be able to say, is this better or worse than what we would have expected based upon previous and known other data? Um, I think that, that may, might be overselling it. I think it's, it's really just a way to have something that's persistent that defines how links should be costed as opposed to, yeah. Uh, having something that's transient where the link costs can be established, but then are lost over time. But, uh, and, and so if you, if you think about network configurations, like even, um, I can't remember the name of the company right now, um, but if where you have like landline and you may have a satellite backup, you may have something else that's, that's very expensive, um, combining the link costs and, you know, edge router policies or, or other policies you could, bind certain services yeah so they'll normally take the cheap route they'll only they will but only they will take the expensive route um things like that um and, and i know we had a, an early case wasn't affirmed it was the other um 5g uh, we were talking to a long time ago where they had a very similar case where they wanted to be able to cost the the more expensive path for failover um, et cetera, but that was build per and, and things like that. So you begin to get that where we didn't, we had part of the mechanism, but to Paul's point, it, it was tied to an ephemeral entity. And now that he's reduced it to one link per type, then, you know, you can apply that model back to it and, and make that persistent. So it, it solves some problems and some corner, kind of corner cases, but I think they'll become more important as we go, as we go forward. Um, and so, yeah, the, uh, we, we also, uh, Cam recently added support for uh, router costs. So if you've got a router in a, that's in a place that, that needs to be more expensive, you can do that. Um, and I think that generally covers like, you know, if, if you wanted, I think in most cases, you only want to kind of cost things up on a, on a link specifically if you've got multiple links, right? So um, in that case, the, the, the the ability to kind of tag it and do costing based on that, or do it based on um, things related to the to the interfaces, uh, which you know that's something Todd's working on is the support for multiple interfaces. Um, any other questions on on the link changes? So when okay. you say we talking back on existing traffic when where possible, uh, assume that there is a link which is not in use because of uh, higher cost or higher latency um, will heartbeat not exist on such links which are not in use um that, that's we've talked about that and uh that's that's kind of an open question right if, if you do have a more expensive link you don't necessarily want to be running a, a fast heartbeat over all the time right because that's going to be expensive so it there's been suggestions around either being able to uh, turn the heart beating off or down for specific links or to maybe even defer establishing those links until they're needed. Um, 
but that's kind of uh, to be determined how we're going to handle that specifically. So I think we want we want to get that's probably like a, a phase a phase three. So first we want to figure out the the multiple interfaces and link costing, and um, then refine it with a way to uh, make the heart beating work uh, specifically. You know, one another thing that we might end up doing is moving. You know, we've kind of moved some of the intelligence from the controller into the router here. We might continue to move things down to the router, and uh, you know, just give the router the information about what it can connect to, and then let the router manage manage those connections on its own. If we go that path, which I think you know, long term seems likely, then um, establishing certain links uh, on an as needed basis probably would be the most efficient way to do it. Okay. Um, all right, so where are we at with this so far? So um, we have prototype draft and it's being uh, pushed in at the fabric level right now. Uh, the control mesh is being worked on. Uh, the link management stuff is, has been released um, and the uh, moving sessions to, to JOTS is uh, in planning. I think Andrew's planning on starting on that in the, in the near term. Um, and there's still a lot of other things that we need to do. Uh, you know, if you've got a cluster of, of controllers, we now need to make sure that when we establish that cluster, that we have identities and certs uh, for those things. We need to be, manage manage those certs. You know, how do we how do you spin up a new controller? How do you create the certs for it? How do you uh, make sure that the other uh, controllers know that it's okay? Um, we need to do distributing routing bits. Uh, there's probably some. Changes coming for SDK clients and SDKs generally. Uh, you know, we want to make sure we maintain backwards compatibility, but there are probably things we're going to be able to do uh, to make newer SDKs work better in a distributed world. Um, and you know, there's there's going to be lots of work that we need to do with testing and making sure that cluster management is, is straightforward. Um, and then how how are we actually going to? You know, what's the the development process for this? Is you know, we want to do this as a as a steady stream of, of smaller features rather than you know one huge release. Um, a lot of these things are are things that we'd probably be doing anyways, right? Like the link management refactor was something that made sense for ZD as it currently stands. Uh, moving sessions to uh, JRTs to be you know bear tokens is also something that makes sense in a single server world. Um, some of the other things that you know obviously are are purely. Uh, HA features like raft and multiple control channels um, are things that that can coexist with uh, single server ZD. They can, um, you know, moving things to be event based uh, will still work even if you don't have a cluster to push those events to. Uh, so they're just a case of telling it whether we want to distribute those events or not. Um, and things like multiple control channels also, you know. If you can support multiple, then that multiple could just be one. So uh, if we can keep uh, keep these the, the changes smaller, then we can uh, have smaller pieces to test, smaller and smaller pieces to validate, and then we kind of get more confidence over time as these get rolled out to customers. Um, and it, it does take work not to break things, but it it probably will take more work to manage uh, splitting the Z development across you know two big separate versions. So we're going to try to avoid that. Uh, as much as possible. Uh, after after HA and distributed control, um, the next big focus is going to be on testing infrastructure. So, uh, infrastructure for doing performance testing and, and flushing out bugs, and you know we'll probably be doing some of that um, in. We'll, 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 and we've already started that work, and we'll be doing that in conjunction with HA work, because um, we're going to need some of it for HA as well. But there's also just a, a, a long list of potential improvements that we've uh, talked about to the fabric, uh, changes to way we do routing, changes, you know, pushing uh, routing out to the edge. Uh, there's, there's just a lot of uh, things we'd like to try, and we need to make sure that those things are actual improvements. So we need a, a way to test them and make sure that they are, are better and that they're bug free once we release them. So uh, getting the infrastructure in place is going to be key, and then we can um, start uh, working our way through that list and uh, trying to improve, improve things in general. Uh, so that's it. Any questions?
Um, in like, do we have any idea around timeline to be able to say, hey, now we're able in ZT and or in MOP to click a button or if it's just CT to deploy and have distributed control plane again, broadly, you know, months, quarters. Um, very roughly, like it's, it's probably in like the two to four month range, something like that. So, you know, we're at the point where I, I can, actually, I forgot, I forgot I meant to, to demo it. I was <laughs> going to spin up a little cluster. Uh, I can, you know, I can spin up a, a ZD cluster right now that um, we'll talk to, you know, that, that's set up with Raft and you can create a service and update a service and list services across the cluster and see the changes happening across the cluster. So um, that piece is, is well underway and we're close to the point where it's just a matter of starting to go through and converting the entity types one by one to be event-based. Um, so, uh, and, and from that point, uh, and we need to do some work with the identities and, and the routing and, uh, but we have, we do have, you know, multiple people working on this at this point. So, uh, yeah, it feels, it feels achievable in that, in that time frame. Curious follow-up question. So that, that, that phasing, um, conversation was important because we want to get the base HA capability out in the least disruptive way possible, because we know that's that's critical for a lot of our customers. But calling this ZD.next was also very intentional. So there'll be a point along this time frame, and we don't have our finger on quite when it is just yet, when we're gonna also wanna make a fairly loud splash and that we're gonna, you know, making the move to major version numbers and everything that goes along with that. It'll be a important milestone in, uh, in ZD's history. Yeah, I was, I was thinking along those lines, it's, um... Uh, it makes me think about the the hacker news thing that Clint was commenting on the other day, where they were like, "Hey, using WireGuard, what if the controller goes down?" They're like, "Well, it won't." Being able to say, "Hey, here's a virtual private, you know, overlay network that doesn't have that problem," is is definitely something we want to put some noise around. Curious follow up question as well: Do we at some point want to have anyone kind of beta test before we go to production? I mean, kind of like customer side, because I've spoken to multiple people who are like. Oh, well, it'd be super cool when you have that capability. But obviously, we don't want yes. for it to be painful for them. Yeah, highly interested in that. So part of that testing phase, if we can get a few uh, real customers, real live scenarios, we're all for it. And I assume we'll be you know, pushing this into Mattermost uh, as a first step once we are relatively confident that it's, it's, it's working well. And we'll use that to flesh out bugs. And uh, once we're past that point, then and have it running Mattermost solidly for a while, we'll probably look for a beta tester. Cool. And so that's probably going to be like May, June, something like that? Maybe. I mean, don't, I don't, don't go set timelines with people just yet. Um, I don't mind if you go fail out customers, make sure we got a list. Like I can think yeah. of a couple right now who I, I know would be interested in it. But yeah, yeah. probably we're on that kind of time frame. Yeah. Um, just a quick comment. Um, will we be able to support kind of, you know, version seven as it exists today and then somebody spins up another network and it can be this next gen ZD? You'll have both. We're trying to make it uh, easier, easier than that. So we're trying to make it more seamless than that. There will be a, a you know, like a major version update at some point will require all ZD components to go, but I don't see that as a major, like, uh, and not like a V6 to V7 kind of move more like just a major update to ZD, which we've done a number of those with customers, but we're going out of our way to make that be um, less painful than maybe we, we would have required it, that kind of change to be in the past, which costs us because, time and money, so you, but I think it's a, it's a good move at this point in our history. Do you, do you think that such an upgrade could happen, you know, like zero touch from the customer, or do you think it still requires the customer's involvement? Yeah, we're at the point now where we're, we have the underpinnings in to make it low touch for uh, doing those kind of grids. And we'll continue that with, with this style as well. Okay. Well, great. I mean, you know, one of the things that we struggle with in sales and, you know, trying to translate everything that we just heard is we talk about the fabric being intelligent. 
you know, we talk about the fabric, you know, as part of our intellectual property. And, you know, we as salespeople need to translate things like link costing and, you know, CPU bound versus network bound. And, you know, we, we need to translate the, the brains of the fabric for the customer to see value in our SaaS, right? Um, because when the customer sees, you know, some routers deployed, to them, it looks like Cisco. Cisco can do that too, right? It's like, well, there's a box there, there's a box there, there's a box there. You know, if we don't do an effective job selling the SaaS aspect, which largely boils down to, you know, the intelligence of the fabric and, and the operation stuff that Robert's team does and the salt stacks and all that kind of stuff, um, we're missing a big part of our value prop, right? So- No doubt. I, I think there's, there's two aspects of it. There's the, the ground up positioning of it which is what Paul just revent, what Paul just went over is very appealing to somebody who's a, a software engineer. So it's a, you know, a lot of kind of state of the art type work. So just this level will be compelling from a ground up uh, point of view. Someone looking at it will say, Hey, you guys know what you're doing. This is pretty cool. I'm going to be part of it. Top down is a little different. I agree. That's where we need to frame up, you know, the value of distributed control. Paul touched on the uh, link costing. Um, that's something that's come up in our customer base a number of times with some real world use cases, but I think a separate session, maybe like a product huddle like session where we focus more on the top down aspect of this would also be in order. I think just answering the question, you know, what makes the fabric smart, you know, uh, and attempting to answer that question is a good place to start. And from a salesperson's point of view, you know, it's, um, it's Paul Lorenz. Yeah. Paul Lorenz makes the fabric smart with help from Cam and Todd. Should I just send his LinkedIn link? Should I just send the so LinkedIn link? So there is a support you know, document well, on smart routing, uh, Mike, uh, which, which we created many months ago. Uh, it was circulated to all customers as part of the platform update, and there's a support document on that. And as we uh, release more enhancements to our smart routing with what you saw just now from Paul, we'll be updating these documents. So with, with, for, with the current capabilities, a document on how smart routing works exists. It is public. Yeah, but like if I were to translate a medic six to a medic ten, mm -hmm. it it's the person that's at a medic med pick ten understands the value of our fabric and our SaaS product, right? A, a, a medic a med pick six, they have some basic pain and they think we can help, right? Um, and that's a pretty big differential when it comes yes. to winning the, winning the deal or not winning the deal. Mm -hmm. right? Okay, I think the cool. things I would emphasize for, for that um, would be, you know, smart routing, uh, the uh, HA capabilities with, you know, multiple terminators and all the health checking stuff that comes with that. And then I think, uh, especially from like a SaaS perspective, the, uh, the transparency, like, so the, the, the ZD fabric emits a ton of metrics and a ton of information. And, um, you know, Mike's team has done, a, I think, a really good job of taking that data and turning it into things where the customer can see, you know, here's exactly, so like, like, you know, the transparency aspect of it, I can see what my network is doing, I think is, is very important as well. I would massively echo point. that. And Seren, actually, if we don't have it already, we should start creating a, a help page on, on dial health. I had a 30 minute call. It's already ready uh, and it's been published to all customers on service dial awesome. health. Please share it. I've not seen that one. Um, yeah, I had a 30 minute call with some Microsoft people this morning uh, as a result of us closing John Kill's IT. And when I was showing them that, they were like, oh, this is amazing. Like, we can now see how the network is performing without owning the network. Um, yeah, please, please, I mean, because I showed it in the console, but I'd love to have an article on that. If you can share it with me directly, Serena. Yeah, there's, there's something a, there's to it. Yeah, just me. That's something that, that's continued to evolve as well, right? Um, you know, Mike Corman is uh, helping push that. He's always, you know, deep into customer issues. And so as he finds places where he needs information, he tries to help us provide that information. So like, uh, you know, Cam just uh, did some work to help distinguish between different kinds of dial failures and add more information. So we have a better idea, like, you know, when something isn't working, we can hopefully have a better idea why it's not working. Yeah, and uh, Mike, it, it's on our to-do list at some point, but it just hasn't been done yet, to um, create a blog which very clearly and in a very high level summarizes the value of NetFoundry versus OpenZT. Um, 
if anyone has suggestions as to what we should put on that or if that's Seren, like there's just like mention these 10 documents and add some, you know, some extra text. Uh, we can do that. And in fact, we share some links and it could be even quicker to produce it. I think the, uh, like, also, uh, certainly, the, oh, go ahead. So we're at, the, we're at the point now where we can start talking about the depth of things that are done in ZD and available through MOP and, you know, augmented through MOP. We just start knocking down the list of, you know, how deeply we go in some of these areas around availability and performance and reliability that you start comparing this to other players in the field. It's like, we're now getting to be the company that can say, sure, the barrier, the barrier to entry isn't a base, simple overlay network with some, you know, uh, controls on it and some policies on it. It's now very large. So the, the barrier is way different for us than it was say even a year ago. I think the, the operation stuff that, that um, you know, Mike's team has added is huge. The transparency and then the, uh, you know, the upgrade, automated upgrades, I think is super huge. I mean, it's it, be able to upgrade all your routers and, and with, with you know, push of a few buttons is, uh, I mean, it's like a, an ops person's dream. That's a good point too, Phil, that, uh, that dial health is a, it's a big deal. So that's, uh, for me, you know, in previous iterations of our releases, it was kind of difficult to understand the health of the network. And people had talked about like, uh, you know, let's focus on the green as opposed to the red, but really understanding if a network is healthy and how healthy it is, is really what that exposes. So, you know, I can look at it and say, oh yeah, I know that uh, this user's having trouble, but 98% of the uh, service activity is 100% helpful or 92%, I mean, that's high value. Not only from understanding, you know, what level of service you're actually receiving, but also in you know, pinpointing where is, you know, an issue with the customer's network. Um, particular, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I was on a call the other day, I, I think I was understanding that we're going to have the distinction of the failures on ZT or the failures on your local network. That is gold for for understanding what, how the overlay and underlay are operating. Yeah, I would say we're improving that. So we've actually added a level of that already that's available, which has proved it's proved uh -huh. itself in the past, but we're improving it to get more nuance to that so we can understand more quickly where the issue is. So I will share a, a quick story about uh, Mike Gorman and I were on the line with one of our customers and uh, they were talking about how in the you know, previous generations, they would often have people come in and say, oh, you know, there's a problem with NetFoundry. And then there'd be a big, you know, huge flurry of activity with NetFoundry people on a Zoom and the customer on the Zoom and the end, their customer's customer on the Zoom trying to figure out what the heck was going on. He said, it's gotten to the point now where someone comes in and says, there's a problem with NetFoundry. He says, no, it's not. Go figure out what your problem is. And he said, so far, you know, for the past at least four months, he's been right 100% of the time. And uh, partly what gives him the confidence is exactly the things you're describing is he can look at it and say, no, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a NetFoundry problem, which is, you know, another nice, milestone in our history.